homelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no, no. Not God Bless America. God damn America. That's in the Bible for killing innocent people. God damn America for treating us citizens as less than human. God damn America as long as she tries to act like she is God. All right. I'm trying to get more energy into this. Core does not do good things to your energy so i'm trying to bring back the you know welcome to the holy shit uh, podcast is happening feeling even though oh, i'm what the fuck? <laughs> just staring at a room they're sitting in a room staring at a wall good morning quarantine yeah that's cool yeah, that's that's something <laughs> we need to do like like news music because i feel like we're trying to take a step to be like a more serious outlet and so the show starts and it's like pod damn america yeah we're definitely <laughs> becoming a more serious outlet after we did an episode about final fantasy 7 last week that's true that's something we're, that's right. a scoop no one's covering it <laughs> um hello everyone and welcome to pod Damn America, el podcasto gothico para los burritos. Um, I'm on week. <laughs> Some of us are learning Spanish in quarantine. I'm doing Duolingo, <laughs> baby. Uh, I'm doing it on God mode. I keep dying. The little owl has <laughs> ripped my head off multiple times for not knowing how to conjugate my you know basic verbs. I'm Jake Flores. Alex Patak is here. Hola! <laughs> Incredible, and Anders Lee is here. Um, los yo Anders Lee. <laughs> Anders Lee yo. Anders Wait, no, 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 sorry, Anders Lee aquí. Yeah, there we go. I've you, done that before. Yes, <laughs> you've done that before. <laughs> Donde style Anders Lee. Anders Lee aquí. Whatever. Okay. I finished Japanese one. You guys can't speak shit to me right now, dog. Can you speak shit to us? In three word for segments <laughs> that include things like, I would like to see a menu. Yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also, um, like, this is good. I'm simultaneously br fucking brushing up on basic Spanish while uh, I should announce this now an uh, upcoming episode of a thing I'm doing would probably, be pro probably will be uh, broadcasted here simultaneously, I guess, on our feed is uh <laughs> with Nestor from Black Banner Magic and I think maybe somebody else I'm not sure if I can say yet um we're going to do a big episode on the Mexican Revolution and so I've been reading about um you know the entirety of the history of Mexico and also like um uh also listening to Revolutions is a good primer the the Revolution podcast or whatever and uh anyway I just got to the part where uh, the Texas Revolution happens, which we talked about a few episodes back. And um, I think I, I had dog shit for recollection about what it was actually about. And um, it's really funny if you read the history of the Texas Revolution from like a Mexican perspective, because uh, it's just a bunch of assholes there's no reason that it happens basically uh texas They're was just like a boot scuffing at the beginning <laughs> what it is is that mexico has this um program once mexico is like independent from spain and it's just mexico and it's like okay we're gonna do mexico shit now it's got these states and texas is one of them and it's like saying like hey you know uh american uh call whatever fucking you, come, you can go live here and like cultivate the land and stuff and like help us set up this state and then a bunch of just like redneck sovereign citizen assholes move down there and they instead of like they just clearly get really clear they have no interest in like farming they're just there because they're pissed off that um that uh about slavery and so to get rid of them they're pissed off about slavery being uh you know fucking outlawed or uh they're being you know contention over it so to, to get like to get two different ide ideas of mexican shit <laughs> <laughs> what happens is essentially to get rid of like a bad tenant or roommate that mexico has acquired in like these sam houston's and shit they uh they go okay yeah we're gonna outlaw slavery too and then they fight a revolution over that and when texas wins they implement slavery again 
And it's really just about that and not really any of the weird, like, independence, come and take it canon shit that this, uh, all the lore is about. It's pretty fucking stupid. Um, yeah. I don't know. Fight me over it. They like slavery big. <laughs> yeah. Does that translate? <laughs> Because by making slavery illegal, it is therefore small. Yeah. All right. That yeah. makes sense. Anyways, first item of business today, uh, the hottest story online, I know we've all heard it, is uh, check this out, you stupid children. The <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. Just Mira. To... <laughs> More than 100 workers at TCG Players Warehouse, which sells Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, and Yu-Gi-Oh cards, have concerns about their working conditions and have decided to form a union against their employer in uh, Syracuse. So there's this big, uh, like one of the biggest secondhand Magic the Gathering card warehouses where I guess the job you have is sorting through used cards and then like repackaging them and categorizing them and stuff uh, to resell. A good manufacturing job. <laughs> There's this... more like uh, more like manufacturing. Am I right? <laughs> there you oh go. Oh my God, Anders! <laughs> You've been holding back on us. So there's these groups of people that have been working in this huge uh, fa- warehouse where they do this in Syracuse. They decided to unionize, and um, I think they were re- met with a lot of resistance from their employer, and. Then just out of nowhere, a freshly, like, unemployed Bernie Sanders decided to endorse them and tweet about it on his, you know, his account on Twitter. And uh, so this group of, like, 150 people got this huge boost from it. And it's really cool because it's it, the story's been sort of uh, mystified a little bit and mistold. I was reading... Sh- comments about it and watching YouTube videos that are put up by like people who are against this unionization and they're just like they're you know they're idiots and they're but they're also just these huge nerds so there's all these YouTube videos where the people are just like um actually uh this is unskilled work uh some guy called them like social justice warriors and the- you must level up for benefits <laughs> <laughs> there are rules to the game but I looked into it, and uh, the long and short of it is that they their premiums for their employer health insurance w- went up by like twenty five percent. So they said their payments went up from like you know eighty bucks to like one hundred and twenty five dollars uh, overnight. It wasn't announced or whatever, so they were all put into a really shitty situation where they were having a ton of money taken out of each paycheck, and decided to send a letter to their employer. The letter is incredible. Um, it it essentially lays out, you know, in uh, pretty plain terms, their grievances and their um, sort of uh, discontent with the conditions in their job. And then it ends with this line. For these reasons and more, we have embarked on, and this is on, in capital letters, or at least capitalized, we've embarked on a quest for knowledge and have <laughs> determined that the time has come for fulfillment, centers work, fulfillment center workers of TCG Player aided by SEIU Local 200 United to unionize. Uh, a quest for knowledge, I looked it up, is a Magic the Gathering card. So they referenced... They couldn't help themselves. <laughs> they couldn't help themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed they got so far through the letter. <laughs> yeah. They referenced a blue Magic the Gathering card that has a picture of a wizard on it in like their direct mission statement about why they're unionizing to their boss. Quest for Knowledge is a one blue mana card. It's an enchantment. Whenever you cast an instant spell, you may put a quest counter on Quest for Knowledge. Remove five quest counters from Quest for Knowledge and sacrifice it. If you have fewer than seven cards in your hand, I don't know why this is uh, about unionization for them at all, but I'm sure they, someone could explain the metaphor. Unionized gamers demand health insurance buff patch now! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's an awesome picture of them. They look exactly like what you would imagine they look like um it's all just hoodies and shit they're all very pale really cool they look like (laughs) they look like us you're saying yeah (laughs) (laughs) but jakes and anders and alex's (laughs) (laughs) 
But uh, yeah, no solidarity with my magic card workers. Um, actually, yeah, it looks like their premiums doubled. It says uh, with the changes, the shares would go from sixty dollars to more than one hundred thirty dollars a paycheck. Um, and the whole thing looks like it got really fucked up when uh, basically they contacted uh, SEIU Local Two Hundred United and announced their intent to unionize. Uh, it says management refused to recognize the union and requested a secret ballot from its employees through the National Labor Relations Board, and then the whole thing got fucking jammed up when coronavirus happened and when their boss basically rejected a, uh, a mail-in ballot because they're all working from home. They gave the ballot summoning sickness. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They're getting mana burned um, and other things. I don't know. So, Who would be a planeswalker in this situation, Jake? You're more familiar with the the lingo than I am. Well, I guess it had to be the bosses, right? I mean, I think that the bosses are the planeswalker, and then the workers are the creatures. So this would be like if your own like summoned creatures were to say, "I'm not going to take it anymore. You keep um, <laughs> you keep me tapped the whole time for mm-hmm. my ability." Uh, my tap abilities and you never let me fight and all of the artifacts belong to the planeswalkers yeah <laughs> um there's one of them made a bernie sanders card which i'm gonna pull up now i think they just imposed really? his face onto another card it's called ristic study and what is uh, it? The, for a skeleton like character no it's for a mage um for some reason they've chosen that tracks they've chosen blue the the mana color of water and um like wisdom to uh-huh. be the metaphor by which they express their uh, class struggle here and and that's why we lost <laughs> <laughs> if we had more of a bold red mountain bernie sanders i think we would still be in this race honestly i think at this point we need to go black swamp bernie sanders yeah <laughs> we need him to be bloodletting and uh sacrificing himself and then redragging himself from the grave or just a card that cursed you know what i think someone probably did use some sort of spell to curse joe biden like a year ago and that's why he's been so fucked up in his head for the past year but it just didn't work because mm, yeah, his dude. campaign was so powerful, they used all the colors on him because what I'm because it's paint. They got they used paint yeah. on him, right? Uh, Mark, where I'm from, we brown. use all the colors. Yeah, I'm the only guy that can walk down the street in a, a black manor deck part of the neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> you know, hang out with a Sen Gear vampire. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be I'll be I'll be walking the plains at night with uh, the angels and all kinds of summoning flying creatures. <laughs> I'm the only fellow I'm the only planeswalker who complains walk through a swamp. I'm the only white planeswalker who complains walk through a swamp. <laughs> 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 all right. So I go to the forest, I've been to the forest. That's what this whole campaign's about. <laughs> so, I bet he was a lifeguard for like a drowning pool of souls. You know, there's gotta yeah. be a card for that. I was the Plus. lifeguard of the mana pool. Um. <laughs> I feel like that's our big campaign uh, complaint with this campaign too. Is he's trying to run a five card deck, and we're like, none of this goes together. <laughs> you that, have no interest in playing any white spells. <laughs> honestly, that's what the Voltron, like Joe Biden, but I'm endorsed by everyone kind of thing is. He's uh, yeah. he's white, obviously, and then uh, I guess Buttigieg is black. He's like evil. Right. Um, I don't think anyone's ever said that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there are very few actual black characters in black man, black Magic: The Gathering decks. There are often very pale, like vampiric creatures. Um, and maybe that's something the union can help with. <laughs> Klobuchar is like an ice deck, and um, who else has he got over there? Yang. Yang is like colorless. I think Yang- I was going to say Yang would be green because he seems like he's all about big monsters, you know? <laughs> like, UBI is a big monster. I, That's you, like your whole deck is built around unleashing UBI. I was going to say UBI is like a mana ramp, but that is a green thing. All right, fair. So this Rhystic Boom! Rhystic Yang study, is green. Next. <laughs> <laughs> the Bernie Sanders card is a card that uh, it's. I think I understand the metaphor here. 
Magic the Gathering is all about metaphors, by the way. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you may draw a card unless that player pays one. So it's like a tax. Like they have to pay one okay. mana. And then the, <laughs> the like, um, color, whatever the fuck the italics are at the bottom of the card. I forget what it's called. Flash or something like that. Uh, just the illustrative tells the story is, I am once again asking you for you to pay the one mana. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh. It's just humor anyone would enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess I should have said up top, skip ahead if you don't understand Magic the Gathering or want to right. understand it. But anyway, I I think this story is really funny because he, like, Bernie Sanders tweeted it from his account, endorsed them, uh, is taking this on as if it's a, a serious issue, which is cool. I don't think think that he understands what magic the gathering is absolutely not like for certain <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's what they would do when in the 70s right they would play like D D style shit D D existed in the 70s magic the gathering did not exist until like right the 90s. so he might i i could see him playing some D D in vermont between campaigns i don't even see him doing that though because no? he seems like somebody who likes like tangible uh, activities where you do something and D and D is like a real time suck. <laughs> yeah. Also, yeah. he would have mentioned it. <laughs> Everyone who's ever played D and D is like, Oh, by the way, you're not going to believe this, but I'm very imaginative. He doesn't See, seem I to played like... it, but a... good. I did a, I, we did a bastardized version growing up where we didn't have any board, didn't have any dice or anything. It was just talking and it was all like us commit. It was just like grand theft auto in like audience, <laughs> just like conversation. Where I'm from, we didn't have a board. <laughs> yeah, we would just talk about like carjacking and and murdering people and that sort of thing. So I don't know if that qualifies. Doesn't so but... much sound like a formalized game, but no, I... it was. We would have like a dungeon master, and one friend would tell the other friend what world they're in, what they can do, and like, well, I do this, I shoot this person, yada yada. Yeah, okay. you sound right. like you were just hanging out. <laughs> right. That's good. Fucking oh. <laughs> um enough. real gamers rise up in quarantine. <laughs> uh another thing that's happening this week is that the coalition to uh primary Alexandria Ocasio Cortez is forming. Who is the person that they're running against her in her primary again? It's like some... MCC M Michelle Caruso Cabrera. Okay, so this is like a, household a name. like a like a Latina conservative uh, MAGA hat she's type a, lady. No, she's a CNBC pundit. She's been like on the air for for a while. I've seen. I've used to see her, you know, like like ten years ago as a talking head. Uh, but Republican she, until I think two thousand ten. Yeah, she she's like a libertarian basically, um, but like a, just a very pro. She's yeah, she's like a centrist. Like an Anna Navarro she's, type she's or something. She's a proud centrist. Yeah, I mean, she's like, uh, like a libertarian who will. I mean, I mean, she says all the stuff that like the Clinton people won't say out loud about like markets and things like that. Like she just like is very against regulation, uh, but she thinks AOC is is preventing her her um, constituents from achieving the American dream. Wow, that sucks. Um... Yeah, that's violence in a way. I so I'm reading here that you sent me Alex. Her <laughs> donors include. Do you want to read this or me? Uh, I don't. Sure, wanna... Well, I guess the only thing you need to know for this is there's an Intercept article about MCC that's like uh, shadowy finance uh, <laughs> candidate challenging AOC, and then a lot of her contributors are like Ugh. actually executives of uh, scary corporations, and then some of them are fun. Let's read <laughs> the fun ones. So the people backing <laughs> MZZ include Facundo Bacardi, an heir to the Bacardi <laughs> fortune. <laughs> His name is Facundo. Every time you do a shot, he gets an inch taller. <laughs> <laughs> Thaddeus Arroyo, <laughs> a leader, uh, a leading executive at AT and T. They just all have incredible names. And uh, Jeff Quatinets, an entertainment industry promoter who has represented Corn and Limp Biscuit in the past. <laughs> Fuck yeah! <laughs> um, ah, they want to break. 
they want to break the uh, left hold on the Democratic Party. Sometimes which, you just want to uh, break I, stuff. Yeah, I think they. I honestly, I think she's gonna win just by the way everything's going. Just like the worst possible shit keeps happening. I think she's gonna win. I think Ziad the activist will primary Ilan Omar and win. <laughs> Isn't he like eighteen? Uh, yeah, something like that. But they'll do a loophole for him. Loophole. They did it all Thought for leader the nookie. loophole. <laughs> <laughs> Just one of those days. You want a primary AOC? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, you don't want don't know, to follow weird. the leader. I'm trying to remember corn references. <laughs> corn. Uh, All I can remember is they did a cover of another brick on the wall, and it was I was so disgusted by it because it like it was a, uh, growing up that's a great song, but uh, they they do a song uh, with uh, Ice Cube called "Children of the Corn." So really? if, they, if Ice Cube is willing to rally against AOC, I do think that would be a major blow in certain sectors. Uh, mm -hmm. Freak on a in leash. The Bronx, freak on a leash we're gonna put the budget on a leash you know what i'm saying yes <laughs> it's this the budget go. needs a leash um my god that's the only corn song i remember uh it's the big one <laughs> yeah. corn one of the first uh mainly white bands to play the apollo since buddy holly why did they let corn play because there was a moment where corn was like you know, hot or whatever. This is like 1999 or some fucking time. I, you know, who's had a job where they read entire Wikipedias, no matter how long <laughs> they are. Do you know the corn song where the guy starts going? Oh, that's like it's freak on a leash. Where he starts going. Yeah. That he, I just thought he was being weird. I don't never thought about what he was actually doing. Uh, but what he was doing was like, like goth beatboxing is the way he explained it. Like he was taking beatboxing, the hip hop thing, but then going, what if, it's, it back. what if it sounded scary? Yeah, he was finally taking it back from those people. Uh, <laughs> that'd be a cool That's conspiracy what this theory. That's all about. Yeah. Has, have we considered that maybe what he was doing is trying to pronounce his promoter's last name? <laughs> Kowinowitz? Um, <laughs> 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 What's that? about Cardi. Ah, oh, oh no, it was Fuc Dude, Fucundo. I can't remember. Um, honestly, the just to be serious for a moment, the breakdown following the beatboxing is one of the heaviest <laughs> riffs in all of music, and so we have a lot of fun on the podcast. But you have to respect that. You really, in fact, do have to hand it to him, don't you? Do you really think AOC will lose? She's like the most popular politician in the country still. I don't think so, man. Um, I, I I don't know. I haven't like really thought about this at all until today. But uh, she's in the. They're trying to do this in the Bronx, right? And Queens, yeah. I her the her people in her neighborhood love her so much. A right. lot of them do. Yeah, I mean, I she, and she, she has Jesus and Miro in her pocket. You know, sure. and that's how you get the neighborhood. Yeah, but the, but the truth is, like, turnout was very, very low in 2018. I mean, that's kind of how she won. And, and like, more um, moderates since then have gotten activated and, like, are, you know. It's kind of like she stole the ball when the ref wasn't looking is kind of like her success story. And yeah. I Which... am, like, a little skeptical, like you're saying, that now that everyone wants her out, if she can keep it. Right. I mean, yeah, she'll I mean, she'll probably prevail. I'm, I was kind of kidding earlier, but it is like something to take serious. Like if you're at, if you're going to phone bank um, with your you know time you have in quarantine, you should make some calls for AOC and to I think that's uh, a little more pressing, actually, because she has a challenger who's the uh, head of the Detroit City Council is trying to right. take her out. And the, they are both the, the future. The son of the Smirnoff Corporation is demanding <laughs> yeah. Rashida Tlaib leave. Right. It's yeah. just really depressing that this is all we have now is, well, I guess there are other races, but like a big part of like, the future of the left kind of depends on protecting these two, these two seats. Rashida like Tlaib doesn't is. believe in American values. This message is sponsored by Henry Southern Comfort, leading the charge <laughs> to, to, to get rid of Rashida Tlaib. All of us here at Amaretto Lime demand absence from yeah. the Tlaib <laughs> <laughs> Foundation. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. I'm Patrick Fireball. Um, Hello, I'm Dr. McGillicuddy, and I'd like to speak to you today about a race coming up. <laughs> Bacardi's a pretty what? stupid rum company. I'm trying to think of one of the worst liquor companies to be an heir of. What is Dr. McGillicuddy the doctor of? McGillic? I Who is that? Uh, you guys don't know about Dr. McGillicuddy's? No, what is You that? guys party? Do you guys like <laughs> well, party at all? What is that a liquor? It's a it's a peppermint schnapps for um Oh the mm. world's worst people. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's when you bypass like uh drinking uh beer but aren't fully on to just grabbing a bottle of vodka and sipping out of it all day, you, you end <laughs> up on Dr. McGillicuddy's. Okay. Interesting. I'm Ooh. Gary Goldschlager. I don't know. <laughs> um, I have not drank peppermint schnapps in so much time, and don't intend to maybe ever. Again. No, you're not. You're not missing anything. I don't think <laughs> that liquor is literally for children. That's like for pedophiles. Like you, it's not good after like 18. But it also will kill children, right? Isn't that like one of the things? Like if you have too much of it, it will just. If you're under a certain weight, just like annihilate you. I think you're thinking alcohol. Of yes. Cats. No, I heard someone yeah, you're say. You're thinking of cats, Anders. Okay. You can't give cats any amount of these. My dog once licked up a beer, and she got so fucked up. <laughs> she was just slipping around on the floor. There's nothing you could do except wait for her to puke it back up. <laughs> oh, that's fucked up. Oh. Um. All right. Well. We should probably get into our interview for today. Um, we should just explain, I guess, what exactly we're going to talk about today. So for anyone uninitiated with uh, the Corbin, uh, what am I even describing? The last two years of his attempt to become prime minister. Three years, really. Yeah. Well, it's it- yeah. ever since he was um, elected leader in 2015, the Blairites, the labor rights, have been out to get him. They've been, you know, pulling out all the stops to um, take back the party, take back the Labor Party. And this kind of, there's a new leak that came out. Someone like emailed WhatsApp messages to themselves, and as a result, like accidentally <laughs> leaked this stuff. But uh, it ended up getting in the hands of Novara Media, which is a good outlet in the UK. And it's yeah, it confirms a lot of what we suspected, which is that the labor rightists have been sabotaging the Corbyn project. Um, what I mean, happened since is it day felt one, like but... a massive conspiracy. And then it was a massive conspiracy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, and the tr- tricky thing is the UK has weird, like libel laws. So there are some people in the report who you're not allowed to say their names or like, I guess uh, British soldiers will come and quarter themselves in my apartment. If we do that, they can't um, it's against our amendments. It's Voldemort. Yeah. but uh yeah it's pretty damning um in one of the things like there's this woman diane abbott who's been on the labor left for for years and they she i think at one point she was jeremy corbyn's girlfriend back in like the 70s or 80s but anyway i have a girlfriend (laughs) (laughs) i don't know what he sounds like Uh. (laughs) he has an american accent yeah uh (laughs) No, but she has been hated by these people, and not only were they, like, vilifying her in the chats and, like, calling her all sorts of nasty names, they also, like, found out that she was crying because she gets all kinds of she's, – she's black, and she gets all kinds of, like, racist shit thrown her way. Uh, they found out she was crying in a restaurant and told a reporter to go to the restaurant and take pictures of her. Like, right. that's how fucking craven – which is only nasty. not wrong because it's not anti-Semitism. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, I think like reading these leaked reports that sort of proved uh, once and for all everything that you could have possibly suspected about the labor uh, or the, the the specific movement to elect Jeremy Corbyn over the last few years being, uh, you know, not even just cons- uh, conspired against by f- people outside the party, but within it itself. Um, it's really depressing and it's also to me i think the the biggest takeaway for me was that i was reading it and um the people talk so candidly in these whatsapp messages to each other and in a way that is very disappointing because i 
have watched every James Bond movie and assumed <laughs> that that espionage across the pond would be a lot cooler than this. But at one point, they uh, refer to something that they're doing as Operation Cupcake, which is uh, fun and cute, I guess. Uh, another point, they just get on this weird riff calling each other trots and like saying, Ich bin ein Hamburger to each other. Well, that's a big thing, like, since, you know, the 70s or 80s, anyone who, like, evinces one iota of criticism of the Labor Party for going a little too far to the right is just called a trot, 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 trot. It's like a, it's become kind of an epithet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, for a second I was like, is, are they, is this also a British term? I'm not, nope, they're just, they're just like us. It could be an allusion to, um, you know, the horses that are so common over there. <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> but no, it turns out, uh, yeah, that's just a thing everywhere, baby. Um, well, yeah, so I guess we should uh, talk to our guest now, uh, Jacobin editor. Holy shit. Yep. I forgot his name. Uh, <laughs> David Broder. <laughs> okay, we'll edit around. We'll, we'll put an edit mark here. Jacobin editor. <laughs> <laughs> Stop laughing. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Jacobin editor, David Broden. Here we go. Broder. Fuck. <laughs> all right, we'll do it one more time. Again. I'm sorry, I'll stop laughing. No, it's we should funny. leave all of this in because now it's funny. Jacobin <laughs> editor. Not a very hard name. Is <laughs> no, I know. I just uh, I forgot to write it down. I just looked at my notes and it just said Operation Cupcake. And I was like, shit. Yeah. <laughs> J- Jackman editor, that. Mr. Cupcake. Okay, all right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pod Damn America. Jackman writer David Broder is here. Welcome to the show, David. Hi, thanks for having me on. David, if you're the European editor at Jacobin, does that mean you no longer cover the UK? Um, no. Ooh, no, good pretty. question. Well, I'll cover it for the next however long we're talking. Um, we have a British magazine too, Tribune, so it's kind of at the same time that started existing as Britain left the EU. So, uh, yeah. As a loophole, I see. I get it. <laughs> mm. We need a separate title. I got you, dog. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, Anders, this was your idea this week, right, to cover the um, what I am to understand is a massive conspiracy against Jeremy Corbyn that has been sort of leaked. Right. A, a bombshell report was uh, was leaked. Um, just a ton of details that are both like shocking and not shocking about ways that the labor rightists who are in positions of, of power in the party were like sabotaging. Uh, Corbyn in the the 17 election or slow rolling anti-Semitism uh, investigations in order to to make him look bad. Um, I guess we'll start. David, what was some of your what was your initial reaction to this? Were you um, surprised or not surprised, angry or just despairing or just kind of a mixture of all that? Um, I wasn't entirely surprised. I mean, we knew that um, these people didn't want Labour to win. Uh, If you take people like um, Peter Mandelson, who was a minister under Tony Blair, you know, he had publicly said beforehand he did something to undermine Jeremy Corbyn every day. um, That was public. That wasn't even a a part of the leaks. That's something he said out loud. Yeah, I mean, he was unembarrassed. Um, But, you know, like, um, and, you know, there was the coup attempt against Corbyn a few years ago. So, you know, we were well aware, and obviously even just through... uh, friends and stuff working for the party, like you hear some of this stuff going on, uh, but it was kind of uh, impressive nonetheless to see the uh, collated evidence uh, because, you know, one of the people involved had uh, obviously hoping to fuck over the people later on, had emailed the evidence to himself. Like he emailed himself like tens of thousands of WhatsApp messages. So when he had to give over the emails to be looked through for the report, Lo and behold, all the evidence was there. Um, so, I mean, you know, I mean, I guess I guess I wouldn't really say I was that angry or surprised because it, it doesn't, you know, it, you know, it's what we knew. But, you know, obviously it's bad if people are putting loads of effort into supporting the party and then, uh, you know, the people who are running it are like deliberately losing. And you're in the in the comments, they very directly and repeatedly say, 
how much they're working to ensure we lose. Um, and then, you know, I guess um, it's also pretty funny because, you know, these liberals and stuff are exactly the people who say, you know, they try and make everything about like personal feelings and like, you know, perceived slights and offense and stuff. And then you just read their own private messages and they're just like full of racism. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is uh, pretty vindicating in terms of, uh, you know, being told you're a crazy tinfoil hat person for insisting that this is probably going on for a long time. Um, I think the thing that was most jarring about all this to me is I just read a bunch of the leaked WhatsApp messages and um, they're just very unsubtle. Mm. I, I mean, there's just comments in here about, you know, they're, they're talking the way I talk about people I don't like, which is I hope you die in a fire and shit like that, which uh, sure. really is pretty. It did remind me of posters. Yeah. <laughs> it reminded me of angry posters, but, you know, with jobs to do it and shit. Yeah. 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 I mean Maybe they could claim they were they were it was like satirizing other people, uh, but yeah, I mean it was very uh, direct, you know. Yeah, I mean like also though, I mean like they the reaction afterwards is like, well, how dare you put out this private communications? Like obviously, I didn't think anyone would read this, and it's like, well, yeah, indeed, that's uh, the point. And you know, who doesn't get frustrated and say they hope their boss gets uh, you know shot in the face? <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to do self-care, and you had the gall to put it online. Well, um, just to, I guess maybe back up a little bit in case anyone listening isn't really aware of what's going on, because you know, our listeners are probably by and large American. Can you walk us through just a little bit of the, the story of what we learned through this leak, I guess? Mm -hmm. so, um, so the report was produced because there's an investigation into um, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, under Corbyn's leadership by an independent body, uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission. And basically what this leaked report is, is um, a bunch of former staff have produced it. And what it's designed to show is that um, there is this like intense factional atmosphere in the Labour Party prevented the anti-Semitism complaints from being like processed properly. So like one of the big obviously like liberal and Blairite attack lines against Corbyn was to say you know there's all these problems with anti-semitism and he doesn't want to do anything about it but what the report shows us is that when people complained about anti-semitism basically the Blairite employees of the Labour Party deliberately did nothing about the cases in order that it would then be seen that Jeremy Corbyn was doing nothing about it and then um at the same time, though, um, in order to show basically that there's a faction atmosphere in the party, the report produces loads of uh, WhatsApp messages and emails between people who are like right at the top of the party, like uh, executive directors of like the party organization, in which they very repeatedly and explicitly describe how they're trying to sabotage its chances of winning the 2017 general election. Um, like deliberately misallocating resources, just giving money to their own friends rather than like constituencies, you know, areas where the party um, most needs money in order to actually beat the Tories. Um, one of the funniest and most revealing parts of the report is um, the night of the 2017 election when we got the exit poll that showed that Labour had done much better than expected and denied the Tories a majority. Uh, the, the tone of the, these <laughs> emails among the people who are like leading the campaign is like total devastation. <laughs> um, so uh, indeed, like one of the uh, one of the people even like sort of saying that um, they've made like a safe space yeah. in the office <laughs> of the chairman of the Labour Party for the staff of the Labour Party to like have a little cry and uh, <laughs> feel sorry for themselves because obviously they have to go through the like effective labour of like pretending to be enjoying themselves on a night of celebration when in fact they're dying inside. Yeah, I think that was probably yeah. the funniest part of this whole uh, like leaked correspondence to me is that, uh, and to be clear, these are people like within the Labour Party who are organized, or they're sort of conspiring to throw the election because it would be worse for them if Corbyn won than if, if they didn't even get a majority at all. I mean, it's 
Right, which goes against their whole shtick of just the center left internationally, which is like we want to win. You, you, you on the left, you don't care about winning. You don't care about actually holding power. And this turns out that they don't. They, they are actually the ones who don't. Um, is it? Is, do we have enough in this to uh, say definitively that the, what they did, had they not done it, um, prevented Corbyn from achieving power? Well, I mean, we don't know exactly what effect it had. But then again, like in that election in 2017, had Labour got uh, two and a half thousand more votes nationally and you know, like located in the right places, we'd have had enough seats to form a minority right. government. So, like, yeah, it did make a difference because, you know, they were they were pouring hundreds of thousands of pounds into wasteful races that, you know, basically we were already guaranteed to win and they were doing it deliberately. At the same time, you know, like party money that could have gone elsewhere. At the same time, these were the same people who were like constantly leaking information to the right wing press, deliberately building up this story about anti-Semitism. One of the things we know from the report is that they they deliberately um, gave people like including, say, um, Ken Livingston used to be the mayor of London. He was suspended on anti-Semitism charges. Corbyn wanted to get, like, get rid of him and get the issue over with. And these people who made a big deal out of anti-Semitism, deliberately saw that he was unpunished so that Corbyn would look bad. So, you know, I think they definitely had a, a material effect in undermining him. And, you know, it's like basically these, it's like, you know, with uh, Biden, you know, it's like these liberals say that um, we are undermining the need to unite everyone to kick out the evil right-wingers and fascists and so on. Yet at the same time, obviously, you know, they would rather five years of five more years of the Tories than five years of Jeremy Corbyn. Right. Because, you know, the main thing for them is to get their party back. My favorite part of it was, uh, wasn't there, there was an, uh, an election, I don't know if it was the 2017 one or one of the ones after it, where uh, uh, the people in charge of the campaign were essentially just going into an office and texting each other all day instead of starting the campaign. I mean, I, I don't know about that incident specifically, but there were certainly like people who were, paid you know and these people were paid you know more than a hundred thousand pounds a year to work for the labor party and they were literally like doing nothing and you see you kind of right. saw it in the campaign which is that only the people who supported corbyn actually like bothered to go out and <laughs> right, the people effort. who are right. giving their labor away for free to labor uh -huh. The only yeah, reason yeah. that stuck out to me was uh, the fucking Mike Bloomberg campaign had people who were intentionally <laughs> sabotaging it, signing up and doing that. But they were like not official members of the Democratic Party. They were saboteurs. <laughs> right. It's embarrassing. Well, <laughs> well at so, least they got paid. No? Yeah. Right. Hey, who's laughing now? I think uh, <laughs> my main takeaway from this is that, you know, from reading like just the completely unmasked tone of these correspondences going back and forth and being something that shifts from like, uh, you know, ha ha ha, these people are idiots, they'll never win to like, dear Lord, it's happening. And then like kind of the ultimate punchline of, you know, these people who are conspiratorial assholes turning and going there's a safe space in my office if anyone needs to cry right now because this thing happening <laughs> like that, that whole thing uh pretty much you know it's hard to read that and really maintain any um assumptions or auspices about uh what we're told most of the time about our big center left institutions and how they you know actually totally want all this actual farther left stuff to happen but it just you know they're you know, we have to work to get they there just right? can't get it. and so i guess for me this story uh what i'm trying to get out of it is does this is this an analogy for what we can assume about our very similar well not very similar but somewhat similar institutions over here in america uh given that we're kind of engaged in that discourse right now with our own people who are, who are kind of trying to convince us that this level of of uh conspiracy isn't happening like within or didn't just happen within our own parties like does this say something about the nature of these institutions you know are we rubes forever assuming that this isn't fucking happening yeah i mean i think it i mean i think it probably the mistake is to kind of imagine that like we on the left have our own like principles and like ideological project and so on and that these people don't mm. like like i mean in, in a certain sense i mean i mean obviously in a way it's like 
you know, it's like amusing to see how much these people hated Corbyn and how much they're undermining it. But it's not as if like we don't hate people like Joe Biden or whatever. Right. right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, you know, they are political opponents of ours and they're aware of one of that. So they are well they are well aware of that and that we don't have the same project. And they were very active in, in undermining us when we had the leadership. And you know, you can certainly speculate that if Bernie Sanders had been the Democratic candidate, then it's not like all of the Bloombergs and Bidens and Clintons and whatever would just have like rolled in behind him to support him against Trump. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, obviously it's always fun when like, you know, conspiracy theories are true. And, you know, like you can look at lots of examples where like people in, uh, you know, like when um, in like the 70s, when the Red Brigades kidnapped the Christian Democratic leader in Italy and, to, you know, they ultimately killed him, like his party colleagues did nothing to save him because they wanted him out of the way. I mean, this stuff isn't entirely uh, new. I, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's like we're not all just uh, on the same side. We shouldn't be too naive about that. Right. That was the thing I was most scared about. If, if Sanders managed to get the nomination that the DNC would just sabotage him. So our best bet was, you know, forming uh, and, and participating in institutions like DSA that actually had a vested interest in getting him elected. Um, but this is all coming on the heels of a an election just a few weeks ago for the new labor leader. Uh, of course, one of the big issues was anti-Semitism and, and treating that more um, actively, I guess. Uh, and I, in sort of, in an ironic way, the the leader they elected to take charge of that is a guy who looks almost exactly like Richard Spencer, uh, <laughs> Pure Starmer. Um, he's he seems like he's sort of in the, he's, he's sort of like I guess a, an analogy would be the uh, Elizabeth Warren of the UK. He's kind of like in the middle of of labor in some ways, but in others, like you know, he's um, he, he signed a pledge I think saying that. Uh, anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism or something like mm. that. Um, what will the fallout be? Allyship, it, it, Anders. Right. That's what it's called. <laughs> yeah. Is he going to hold any of these people accountable at all? Should we we, we expect anything uh, to come from, from, from Starmer on this? Uh, no, I wouldn't think so at all. I mean, he has said uh, that he's going to long... Like, he basically, he, when the report was leaked, he kind of replied going like, I am appalled to hear about this. We must have an inquiry. And there were three points. And like one of the three points is like, why was this report written? The second is, why are the people <laughs> saying this stuff? And the third is like, who leaked it? Uh, and like this kind of whole like kind of data privacy angle has really been pushed to the fore already. You know, the, the people who are named, who, you know, are suffering because their, uh, you know, their info has been leaked. Um, but like, you know, he, uh, you know, when it said like that he is electable, what that means is for the for the right wing of the party, they're OK with him being elected. It doesn't mean that he is going to be elected or that he is going to be able to make up for, uh, you know, Labour's losses of like leave voting, working class northern seats. I mean, he's rubbish. I mean, particularly what's frustrating in all this and it kind of uh, gets what you allude to when you mentioned the DSA, is it's kind of like this report has come out and been leaked. None of the press has given it any attention, uh, like mainstream media, like nothing. Like, And you have this constant line repeated by all these like centrist uh, hacks on Twitter, which is like, oh, well, look, we're faced with a national emergency uh, coronavirus and the Labour Party again is just talking about itself while at the same time what they want the Labour Party to say about coronavirus is isn't Boris D Johnson doing a great job and because it's a crisis we should all come together so it's like we're not even allowed to mention this report Starman knew about it at least a week before it was published uh, now there's uh, lawyers who are trying to shut up people talking about it so uh, one of the main people, in fact, one of the main people mentioned in, sorry, one of the main people mentioned and quoted in the report, uh, Emily Oldno, uh, she was actually Keir Starmer's uh, planned choice to be the next uh, chair of the Labour Party. So like she probably now won't be able to do that because she's like embarrassed herself so much through these mm -hmm. messages. But he, you know, she was someone who, and you know, she is married to the shadow health secretary. 
So these are people who know each other. It's, you know, I don't so imagine... Many victims. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, it's just this incestuous bubble. Of pe people are also involved in the media, too. It's like very, you know, we, we talk about how the media was out to get Sanders in the beginning, but it seems like it's even worse in the UK with, you know, the, the labor left. Well, Corbyn um, got farther, I think, is what it is, right? I mean, he was the well, head of the Labour Party. That's part of it, but also media institutions in, in the UK are even more, like, reactionary against the left. Is that fair to say, David? Mm, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, is the, 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 the like, liberal, uh, you know, stuff like, if you look at, like, the Guardian, say, I mean, I guess it's broadly analogous to like MSNBC or something. Right. Like the like unremitting, constant hostility towards Corbyn. But of course, you know, the fact is, you know, he was leader of the party. He was elected twice, and all of the liberal and mainstream left wing media are implacably hostile. But mm -hmm. they didn't give up even after 2017, where he got 40 percent of the vote. You know, they didn't quieten that down. And like, obviously, you know, it's pretty hard to imagine that what these people say in their WhatsApp messages revealed in the report isn't also what they're saying to their own uh, husbands and wives or to their personal friends, who include Keir Starmer. So, I mean, I think his claim to be to not to know about it is pretty thin. Yeah. Um, but part of the problem we face, though, is like, in a way, like the out the outcome of this is just people feel even more. You know, I mean, people like activists on the left of the party just feel really disgusted, but also kind of impotent, you know? Yeah. It's like, these people were trying to fuck us. We now have this massive amount of evidence that they fucked us. And like, now it's like we can't do anything about it. So I think, unfortunately, it's probably encouraging people to leave the party entirely because it's like, we lost. <laughs> and, and, you right. know... The, the media blackout you're describing is not only uh, effective, it's very tangible. Like, I'm looking up stuff on this incident for this episode a few hours ago, just to brush up on it. I type in Corbin anti-Semitism. The only things that show up on Google are just The Guardian, Corbin anti-Semitism, real, real victims, 100%. <laughs> there's like 10 articles in a row, and you have to, like, add in the modifiers of WhatsApp and leaks for you get, like, the independence throwaway yeah. article about it real it's yeah. you would never know if you weren't barely looking. legal yeah. anti-semitism victims live the <laughs> i think like not to beat a dead horse or whatever but uh the fact that this is being downplayed so much in the media is very telling just in that if can you imagine if something like this were leaked and proven to have happened to cause hillary clinton to not win that election it oh would be yeah. the only thing that is reported on all day every day and i know that's true because they're reporting on it anyway and it didn't fucking happen with like the russiagate stuff it's like a hundred percent of certain people's news cycles so the fact that that's uh, a non-story whereas i think it would be a huge story in other situations just tells you so much about you know the selective nature of the media right. it's a story Th for some people and not for others yeah. Yeah. Let's well, this say. is making me wonder now, like if you're a labor leftist and you're watching this all unfold, you've been in the party for the past five years, should your conclusion be anything other than we should do the same thing they did? We should try to thwart, undermine, sabotage and try to force out Keir Starmer and replace him with another leftist. Well, um, you know, I, I mean, I would be in favor of that. I mean, I think the problem is that I mean, the problem is basically like people feel really demoralized after the election. Then in the Labour leadership contest, the left did poorly. Yeah. Uh, you know, Rebecca Long Bailey, our candidate, she got 27 mm percent. -hmm. And then this uh, report and stuff is encouraging even more people to leave. So it's like the kind of base of activists basically becomes weaker because it's like you're saying to people, come and join the struggle to take over a party. And we probably won't have any real results for like several years, which is quite, you know, demoralizing. Um, and also, of course, it's like, I mean, I think the, the, but, you know, I mean, we did make some progress in changing the structure of the party. Like, you know, these people were talked about in the report. They're not employed in those positions anymore. So, you know, there are some people on the left who've like taken over those roles. Uh, but I think the lesson is, you know, with the whole anti-Semitism stuff in particular, 
is just we needed to be more like hard headed about like calling out the bullshit it was. Right. Like one of the things revealed in the report is like half of all of the complaints about anti Semitism came from a single person. Yeah. So like, you know, I don't doubt that a lot of cases are real, whatever, but like it's one thing to have like a few hundred people posting like Rothschild shit on the internet and then like an and then, you know, institutional racism. You know, I mean I think the problem is it's like it's like, you know, with this report the media don't touch it. Whereas every individual incident of someone complaining that they'd been spoken to harshly or that, you know, Israel was being maligned was like massively whipped up. Um, I mean, indicative is the fact that the lawyer who's trying. So basically, there's this lawyer who's trying to um, he's representing uh, Emily Oldno. Uh, so one of the people involved and he's trying to basically silence like Navarra media and other leftist outlets. He's trying to do injunctions. So they're not allowed to talk about the report. And this guy is uh, presented in media as just like this libel lawyer, whereas what he is, is one of the leading members of like a far right Zionist party. Uh, and yeah, he was recent previously like uh, brought up in the BBC and stuff as like, Oh, like me and my wife are going to have to move to Israel because of the mounting climate of anti-Semitism in Britain. And, you know, he's mm-hmm. actually one of the leading, <laughs> you know, organized, you know, he's like a, an organized political Zionist who's on the far right wing end of Zionism. And then just like his comments are taken, you know, completely as good faith and whatever. And I think, you know, some of that kind of stuff probably needed to be a bit more uh, sharply uh, combated. Right. And is that a fair criticism I've seen some people make of Corbyn that he should have been a little more ruthless? He had a little too much Ruth in him uh, and that he didn't like take action and make sure these people didn't have the positions that they did. Could he have done more in that case? It was difficult. I mean, because he had so little of the institutional weight of the party on his side to begin with. And because, you know, that basically there were constant kind of coup attempts against him and basically after the good result in 2017 i think he thought that if the party did well enough then there'd be strong enough for case for unity and everyone would come on board and that basically thing was wrong at the same time um you know he did do some stuff in terms of like changing the processes for dealing with these complaints uh and you know some more basically left-wing and pro Corbyn and loyal people came into these kind of uh, positions in the party and like, you know, doing stuff to actually handle the complaints in the efficient way, which hadn't done them to the Blairites. So yeah, I mean, I think he, he's, you know, part of the problem is he's too nice. Right. You know, I mean, it's like his vision of socialism is a bit like once the case for like, it's like, you know, once the moral case has been made and everyone has understood it properly, then that's what we'll do <laughs> rather than in terms of like we need to like fight and kick out these these people because they're wreckers and enemies yeah and it seems like another thing they sort of force his hand on this is something you've written a lot about is, is brexit uh because in 17 correct me if i'm wrong but it seemed like he was the platform was basically assuming that brexit would go through and then in 2019 their uh, position was, let's ha- have a second referendum. Um, do you think that costed them the was played a role in costing them the election in in nineteen? Yeah, definitely. Because firstly, because as you say, in twenty seventeen, we said we're going to carry out Brexit. We'll do our Brexit with our priorities, defending jobs, defending migrants, and so on. Yeah, and then like in twenty nineteen. The position was totally different so firstly like when you went door to door saying to people oh yeah like we're gonna honor the referendum result and the way we're gonna do it is to negotiate a new deal on how to leave the eu then we'll put it to another referendum in which jeremy corbyn will not take sides mm-hmm. like that didn't sound very plausible at the same time like the mere fact that we changed the position added to a general sense of like unreliability and indecisiveness like if you're saying to people we're going to tear up the economic consensus of the last 40 years and change the way this country works and people think well that's a bit you know uh 
a bit over ambitious. And then on the most fundamental issue of the day, you change your position twice in three years. Then it's hard for people to believe, you know, that you're going to do what you say. So I think it was really fatal for Corbyn's leadership. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been really sad to see, um, you know, just a few months ago, it felt like just the weight of history had both these guys, Corbyn and Sanders, you know, the weight of history was on their side. It felt to me and I'm, you know, a delusional person, but it felt sort of inevitable. Um, Dude's 2020. (laughs) Yeah. And it's all crumbled apart in a matter of months. Uh, so what are some of the saving graces here? I mean, I have kind of my fantasy that they will like join forces and start some sort of like transatlantic think tank, you know, headed by <laughs> Bernie and Jezza. Um, is, are, is there anything we can be optimistic about on, on either side of the pond for the, what the did the say form a band? Optimism. <laughs> that's quite a question right now. Yeah. I do not feel it. I'm not sure if it is optimistic to hope that they form a band. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> I don't think. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, but Bernie said a couple of uh, songs, hasn't he? Um, I mean, I guess, you know, at a very general level, like, well, it's better than it was, you know, five years ago. I mean, you know, I, I was I got involved in the far left in the early 2000s. People who think it was better then than now or hope whatever or wrong like it was rubbish you know Mm -hmm. it's like the sense like it was like what we feel now but just all the time like the sense of like hopelessness not being able to like change the way that big political issues are decided not having ever having your voice heard in the media that kind of stuff so you know from that point of view we have made some progress uh, there's also a certain like amount of like institutional stuff in the say you know there's like thousands of activists who, you know, because of Corbyn's leadership, got involved, who wouldn't have done otherwise, and who take up all sorts of positions and uh, are union organisers and stuff in Labour, and that is the, like, basis for us eventually to recover. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the immediate picture is extremely bleak. Like, you know, we're fucked. Like, you know, Boris Johnson has survived uh, corona, and now he's going to be treated as a, <laughs> as a... He'll be treated as a saint for years. Yeah. Because it's like at the next general election, if Labour try and criticise him at all on the NHS, all he'll say is like, oh, but, you know, I love the NHS. I was there in hospital and I was dying. And two immigrant nurses stood at the end of my bed. <laughs> and I thought, what ah. a great country Britain is. And, you know, it's, it's just hopeless. <laughs> is a man is wounded in combat on the war on shaking hands. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. That was right around Easter, too. What? That'll play into it. He's like Jesus, you know? Mm. Um. Yeah. Coming out of my cave and I'm feeling just fine. That's what he'll say. <laughs> um. That's what he'll say. <laughs> well, David, thank you for, I guess, commiserating with us in, in our, you know, mutual despair here. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, Jacobin. Jacobin. My stuff's on Jacobin. Jacobinmag.com. Cool. Good site. I'll Check look it into out. It. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank hey. you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. No, no, thanks for having me on. Have a good one. Bye. All right. That was the episode, everybody. Uh, Feeling good. Plugs. What do we have? We have a merch store, bigcartel.poddamnamerica.com. Did I do it backwards again? Look it up. It's one of those. It's either cartel, big cartel, or poddamnamerica.bigcartel. Don't let the media bury the, the story of us having merch. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have t-shirts, and they're cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, now, more than ever, you should sign up for our Patreon if you enjoy the show and want to support it and get free or not free, um, episodes, bonus episodes. We do a bonus episode every week. Well, they're free once you pay us. Right, They're right. free once you give us money for them. There's like a hundred of them, okay? It's like five bucks. You could you can get through those in a month. I, don't, I think you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, does anyone else, any, uh, anyone else have anything to plug before we get out of here? Uh, at Anders Lee here on Twitter and... Um... If uh, you want to find out more about what's going on in the UK and support like left media projects over there, because it's really uh, crucial, I think, check out Novara Media. They have um, subscribers as well. Um, 
yeah, they're a good. They're a good source. Also, you know, of course, Trash Trash Future, who did a pretty thorough um, episode about everything in this report, and uh, uh, Tribune, as as David mentioned, all, all good, all good. There's very, you know, there's not enough uh, left media in general, um, but those are sort sort of some of the good things we have over there in the UK. Right. And if you're looking for left media that recaps and summarizes the plot of Dragon Ball Z starting at the beginning, uh, you should really check out Ballin' Out Super because we're on to some great episodes right now. Uh, just pre- primo classic Dragon Ball Z, the stuff all of your kids are talking about. And if you want to relate to your kids and not lose them in the divorce, you should listen to our show. We'll just recap it for you. Uh, so that's Ballin' Out Super. Follow me on Twitter at Patak Jokes. And I'll see you never at the post office. <laughs> uh, listen to my other podcast while you mad. And um, tap all your mana to cast solidarity with uh, TCG Players Union. Uh, t- uh, TCG Player. The fucking... Uh, the, the Magic the Gathering <laughs> duel from earlier. I can't fucking talk today. You fucking know what it is. TCG Players <laughs> Warehouse Workers. Yeah. Um, Look it up. They're, they're, Read a book for once. I will <laughs> link, to tell you what all the links are. Jesus. <laughs> I will link to their shit in the show notes. That's it. It's finished. It's finished. Go with God. <laughs> <laughs>